talking about, again, the coming of the Burmans and basically contentious claims, perhaps a little bit slightly, slightly different angle, on non claims about non-cultural hegemony. So what I'm saying is, as well as invoking the Pagan era as what one of Lucy's main aims, as the apiosis of past glory and the inspiration on which to build the modern nation, Luce considered it's very important to discover, as Patrick told us, where the Burmans, how the Burmans place came to make their home in the <coughs> plains of Upper Burma. And both ambitions, in my view, are indicative of fundamental attempt by Luce to reconceptualize Burma's past in the light of the social and political changes, and we must keep this in mind, I think, when we talk about Luce, that he witnessed over more than half a century of living and working in Burma. For example, the gestation, and as Patrick has pointed out, some of his ideas took several decades to, to gestate, occurred when the country was being riven increasingly by violent nationalist unrest in the early 30s, and then there was, the, as the British advanced from its margin, and then as British Burma advanced from a marginal status as a, pro a province of the Indian Empire, it became a separated crown colony in 1937 and finally achieved full independence on the 4th of January 1948. And then, of course, there was an ensuing civil war after that. So, Lewis, I think might, we might say, saw his role as an intellectual force that might help to facilitate the transition from independence under colonial rule to nationhood, nationhood anchored by the achievements of the past and his lifelong colleague and friend, John Furnival, who was a very blatant socialist nationalist, was very political in some of what he said, but I've never come across anything particularly overtly political that Luce ever wrote. But I do, myself, in my heart, in the, certainly in the 30s leading up, Luce himself, for perhaps altruistic reasons, was also very much on the side of Burmese nationalism, without necessarily flying a political flag about it. So, however, Luce also began working, as we know, at a time when there was little attention was paid to Burmese history, even after the foundation of the Burma Research Society, which I kindly, Patrick, kindly point out, had written on. Uh, they were founded in 1910, when British scholar officials and Burmese professional elites came together to share their ideas about the country's history and cultural heritage. And that was the portal through which <coughs> Luce began to develop his ideas interacting with Burmese people in a scholarly society. And as, but however, he was an outsider, and as I told you about his personal life, a bit, I think you were perhaps gained that impression. And he was noted for nonconformity, not only in his personal life, but also in his approach to scholarship. And, and I, I think his inclination was contrary to statist versions of Burmese history. As Patrick again has mentioned, the Chronicles, uh, they were the um, annals of ancient Burmese kingship. And he was prepared loose to take risks in his own history writing by rejecting, as we know, former dependence on the Chronicles as sources, as reliable sources. And he made, he was happy to make assumptions based on what actually could often be limited epigraphic sources, particularly for the pre-Pagan period when he advanced new theories about how the Burmans came to Burma. He was, in his own words, prepared to stick his neck out, which in his view meant rejecting the chronicles as unreliable, jerry-built structures. That was what Luce said. In his estimation, history, as Patrick again said, as in the way the British concept, he was very much, he followed that idea as a base, was very much about facts and myth, not myths and legends. And he describes these myths these dynastic myths of old Burma as largely tissues of legend, its chronology wild, and even the origin of the Burmans quite mistaken. Fairly bold, rash statements. So it actually is differed markedly from accounts in the Chronicles, obviously. And it's quite interesting to note that notwithstanding, he and Paymontin actually translated the Glass Palace Chronicle in 1923. So this approach, naturally, not unexpectedly, led him to make uncorroborated assumptions that created intellectual and methodolo methodological problems. And, but that notwithstanding, his ideas set the tone for a new dynamic engagement with Burma's past that did not rely 
on the chron uh, only on the chronicles. And so he was one of the first historians to attempt to reconstruct the country's history from sources other than the chronicles. And he did not subscribe to the fact that Burma's, his Burma's history proper, if you want, began with the colonial occupation, nor was his scholarship steeped in British imperial uh, tradition, as people have accused people like Arthur Fair, Edward Parker, and Albert Fitch. Because colonial historians, as Patrick again said, believe that there were continuities with Burma's ancient past, so that if you spoke the same language, you belonged to the same tribe or fixed identity. So Patrick and I obviously have some sort of telepathy because I too read Robbins Berlin. Where did my tribe come from? However, by assigning a causal role to race, or as it's referred to today, ethnicity, these earlier colonial historians continued to influence the intellectual environment that Luce was working in right throughout the early decades. So you must keep that in mind, I think. When scientific and rational ideas of race, nation, national histories were predominating factors in colonial classification of various groups. Anyway, we have now got, so I'll just go a little bit muddled here, so I'll just, let me. So, Luce, although rather, we might actually think that Luce's dismissal, in largely, of the Chronicles is a little bit ironic, since he was prepared to stick his neck out and make things up a bit, if you like, to put it in the neck out. Whereas the old chroniclers, or the monks that wrote them, predominantly wanted to valorise or big up a king's reign. They wanted their monarch, the reigning monarch, to look as if he'd fought great battles and done great things. And so we also sort of you might like to see Luce perhaps trying to do a similar thing on the other side of the coin. But anyway, Luce viewed, nevertheless, he was a professional in that sense. He viewed writing history as a professional endeavour to which the standards, the rational standards of the day should be applied. And he believed that this could be achieved by collecting all available evidence that would enable him to write the history of Burma, because I think that was how he did see it. Or not he might not have written it himself, but he thought that that was what needed to be done from its earliest times. So in order to accomplish this task, he made many excursions throughout Burma over the course of more than half a century. When he was still working before independence, he would use holidays and leave time. But after, when he came back, he was doing it much more under the auspices of the Historical Research Commission. And he, uh, he, went, he studied the inscriptions and to record its ancient languages. And he was assisted on his field trips by Colonel Bar Shin, Bomu Shin. And this man, from my understanding, did a lot of the translation and transliteration work. So there's still a little bit of a mis misconception, unsure, un uncertainty, I would say, as to what depth. Luce was very good at interpreting, but how his understanding of language in the ancient dialect may not have been perhaps all his own. I have no, I, I, I can't, I can't verify that. But he did say that it was very important that the most, the most urgent and valuable and the least expensive way of writing Burma's history was to accomplish this task, and it was to record Burma's ancient languages, which are now on the point of dying out. So we've got another slide here, and here he is with the Bur well, members. I don't know that they're all Burma Army, but we have a fairly dilapidated vehicle. <laughs> and I don't know how they got about, but it did seem to go all right. And here is just a little. He they helped him, I suppose. But what he did say, um, so. Although languages like Old Mon, Old Burmese and Pew were no longer spoken, many of the minorities, as Patrick said, had their own language or dialect. And Bo Mu Shin undertook, as I said, many of the transcriptions and translations that they discovered on monuments or other effigies. And he also admitted, interestingly enough, that the personnel that he worked with, who assisted them, had never or hardly ever heard of the existence of what he called, Luce called, small, unimportant tribes whose languages are, we are at such a pains to record, and they had no idea that they were important. So perhaps that's the view of the ordinary people who were field assistants, if you like, with them. So then, um, we also know that when we come to migration, which Patrick has told us a lot about, he based a lot of his handwritten notes, his work on uh, Chinese sources, and I've got similar 
information here where he believed that the Bur his, he based much of his evidence for the Burman migrations of the 9th century upon Chinese sources. But they were, a lot of his work was using sources in translation. And they were translated by his former teacher, Paul Pelliot, of the École Française d'Extrême Orient. And he paid, and he was the one, I think, that he, to whom Luce owed a lot of his ideas because he paid tribute, and Luce is very generous in tri paying tribute. His former professor's famous article, Deux Itinéraires de Chine, where he traced, where Pelio wrote that article, he traced the overland routes of, from China, from Tonkin to India, that were compiled, this is Pelio's work, by the Tang court minister, Chia Tang. So there's a kind of layering of how Luce achieved his ideas. And he considered that Pelio had laid a firm foundation for future Chinese studies related to Burma by determining that prior to 1050, most written sources about Burma were Chinese. Mm. And from what then on, they remained a priceless secondary source of uniformly high quality. Luce wrote that in A Century of Progress in Burmese History and Archaeology in the Burma Journal of Burma Research Society in uh, 1948. So it's again quite a daring but definite way. Anyway, he used linguistic evidence together with the translation, once again, as actually as Patrick has said, of the Chinese source Manchu, written by Fan Chu, which again Pelio used. So we do have a number of people, if you like, coming into this mix, not least of them Pelio and Fan Shu. And Luce then described, or extrapolated from this, that from the 7th century onwards, tribal groups, this is how he's calling them, dwelt along the border from northwest China to southwest Burma, who had been conquered into servitude by the Nanchu. And they were known to Fan Chu as the Pu, these frontier peoples whom, as Patrick has told us, were regarded as proto-Burmans, who escaped their captors, the Nanchu. And this is what Luce thinks, whether you think he's made it up in the, his article, Phases of pre pagan Burma. They escaped to the hot, malarious plains of central Burma, where Nanchu armies, used to the cold plateau of Nunan, durst not follow them, except in the cold weather. So where the climate came into migration, it appears to be the case, in, Luce, in Luce's view. Anyway, after over 20 years of study, in 1939, Luce published a seminal article, Burma Down to the Fall of Pagan. He wrote that jointly with Paymon Tin. And they described the Burman migrations, and they were quite elegiac and glorified them as the supreme moment in the history of the Burmans when they descended en masse upon the plains of Kauxe, is it Patrick? Kauxe. Kauxe. They produced evidence, the two of them, uh, pointing to the region between my car and the river Salwe as Burmas, as the Burman's principal line of entry. This is in this article. And they eventually inhabited the Kauxe district, where as Patrick has shown you on the map, of Upper Burma as their first home on the plains. So they did a quick shuttle across to that bit outside of Pagan. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit difficult to understand if this is how we can verify this. I don't think we can. Anyway, he did suggest that the arrival of the Burmans in other places, and Kakse, Mimbu, Pagan, and Town Beyond, was completed, he thought it was over, by the middle of the ninth century. However, his theories were not without criticism, because his own former pupil, Tan, Professor Tam Tun, criticized Luce's reliance on using 12th and 13th century lithic inscriptions to explain how the Burmans had, had subsisted for, 13, for 300 years earlier during the Pagan period. Tan Tun maintained that if, as Luce claimed, the Burmans had speedily spread out from the small fertile area around Kauxe to create further settlements, it was impossible to know from the inscription how they managed to survive in the semi-desert of the central plains. And he also dismissed Luce's theories as conjecture and disputed his claims that Chinese sources were of uniformly high quality. And I think that's probably a fair uh, 
a certain fair criticism. And he also pointed out that often things written were not eyewitness accounts. But that doesn't, doesn't undermine Lucy's work, but I do think you need a, a caveat here, because they've been copied many times, as you say, by monks and other people, so errors abounded, and there were errors in translation. However, if we're on slide 17, Lewis considered that, anyway, whatever, how they got there, he thought that the, Mer the Burman migrants gained great benefit from their escape to the Capsay Plains, conjecturing that they had found room for individual growth and national expansion. Mm -hmm. I'm quite interested in the use of the word national in that context, but that might echo something else about... He's not political, but he used that word anyway. And he claimed that successive ethnic groups, like the Mon and before them Pew, had influenced... The der that, that is, you know, fair, fair comment, Burma's cultural heritage. But most controversially, he asserted that those remnants of Mons who were residing in the Kauksei district when the Burmans arrived, had taught them letters and Buddhism. And he stated in Kauksa, the first home of the Burmans on the plains, the victors, that is the Burmans, sat at the feet of the vanquished, that is the Mons, as the Burmans learnt letters and Buddhism from Mons. According to Luce, Burman is of course, are the, is even talking about the ethnic Burmans, the ethnicity, the, or the ones who turned up the proto-Burmans, who he named as soon as they got here, Burmans, arrived in Upper Burmans, had caused the Mons living in the area to flee southward. And as he noted in his, his work I mentioned earlier, Old Burma and Early Bagan, that Mons were clearly numerous in this northwest corner of the district and in doubtless at Kauksa itself. His hypothesis was based on the evidence of a Mon, one evidence of a Mon inscription in the area that had by, been identified by his former teacher, Charles Otto Blagden in Epigraphica Bermin Bermanica. So implicit in Luce's statement is the idea that Mon culture and religion had acted as a powerful, civilised force upon Burma and conquerors in, the, in a similar way that perhaps militarily superior Romans had civilised the weaker and more cultured literary Greeks. So we're still having much more the underlying, the foundational idea of Luce the historian is very much still influenced by the Victorian background that he had been educated in of his, as a historian or of, of history. How was, these claims, however, did prove to be somewhat contentious politically because among Burman's people living in Burma at the time, this is by, by the time he published his book, uh, uh, that's towards the end of the 70s, uh, not only because his ideas were based largely upon his own interpretive work, they also because they contradicted or refuted the evidence of the chronicles. There's still a much uh, adherence, even in the Burmese mind and their, and their uh, understanding of their history, that the chronicles are the basis and to be relied upon. And that is a, a, a very a concept that is certainly worth respecting. Whether that we know, but they have to be seen for what they are. That's why. And they challenged the notion of Burman cultures, and this particular people challenged the notion of Burman cultural supremacy as the founders of the nation, an idea that was particularly prevalent among educated elites uh, in the country before and after independence. And it came to a head in 1971 when. Uh, he received a public rebuke in a series of letters from a correspondent in the Rangoon Times who disputed that the, the, the Burma, his story that the Burmans had descended upon the plains of Minbu and Kauksei in the mid-19th century. And he accused Luce of wild imagination born of prejudice. So he accused him also of humiliating the Burmans by saying that they learned Buddhism from the monks. So what we learn from this, what we can gather from this, is that the ideas of how we label people's culture, even aside from language, ethics, um, in respect of their, their ethnicity, is a very sensitive issue, is what I would say. And so, and many years later, Luce continued with this line, and he, in 1959, I think Patrick mentioned his old coke saying, the coming of the Burmans, he still wanted to pin down this idea by showing that coke was not it was Kauksei and not Tagaon that was the first home in the Burmans after they escaped. And he actually, it's replete the article with his suppositions about Fanchu's 9th 
9th century account of 12th and 12th century inscriptions, which we remember had been just dismissed as conjecture by Tan Tun. So according to Luce, Fan Chun distinguished the various groups of Poto Burmans by the names of their chiefs. But after these so-called tribal groups had migrated to Burma across the border, into the border, Luce assumed assumed that they were like immediately a fully formed ethnic group, whom he named the Burmans. However, despite Luce's categorization of them as Burmans, he gave them that label, he labelled them. It's unlikely that various tribal groups who fled would have identified themselves in this way as part of an ethnically distinct group with common features of language, customs and culture. So I think that's quite a well, Luce has stuck his neck out there, definitely, big time. In the absence of written records, basically, we simply do not know whether or not people recognised a common ethnicity in pre-colonial times and grouped themselves together under a single name. I suspect not. Clearly, over time, migrants and their predecessors had to come, though, to some accommodation with one another through intermarriage as they moved to new locations, humans mixed with their genes and their customs so that every culture and every human population has, in my view, what well, Lucy's view, in fact, oh, Robin Burling, our friend Robin, Robin's Burling, he believes they have multiple ethnicity, ancestries. So once again, we see that colonialism fostered an intellectual environment where classification, according to ethnicity, carried with it linguistic and cultural assumptions which authorised these ideas about its subjects. And in the pre pagan period, it is more than likely that cultural and linguistic borrowings occurred frequently among, as Patrick has mentioned, loan words and things like that. But it doesn't make them ethnically cohesive mm -hmm. um, uh, among coexisting polities so that any traits or influences cannot definitely be attributed to any one particular ethnic group. Now, yeah, it's very difficult to read this, but the high, an interesting turn of events, perhaps, in Luce as a historian, and it shows perhaps a little bit more of Luce the man than Luce the historian. Because as we've seen from what I've said, and perhaps Patrick as well, from the 1930s, Luce held a very pro-Burman uh, view of history in respect of their historiography and their political hegemony, hegemony. By urging future, he actually wrote, he urged the future politicians to look to Pagan as the model for cultural and religious innovation in the modern world. So that was how he felt and he kept those ideas for a long time. But the civil war and independence which, fol uh, which followed independence and his own exile from Burma in 64, I think changed or subtly or modified his views particularly when history writing became an important element in helping Burmese minorities to establish their indigenous identity and rights within the new union of Burma. In 1947, the constitution of the union of Burma continued the colonial practice of dividing country on ethnic racial basis by maintaining the distinction between those who inhabited the peripheral regions or the uplands of Burma and the people of central Burma who are predominantly Bama or as I've been using the term Burma, it is a fluid term but that is whom I mean, and who were mostly Bama Buddhist. And the constitution segregated the upland peoples by describing them as Tain Yinsa, meaning sun close to the territory, whereas those in the centre were Yangon Sa or Mandalay Sa. So in order to claim their rights, as they'd already been designated peripheral anyway, to be considered of Tain Yin Sa, peripheral ethnic groups had to prove that their ancestors were present in Burma prior to the British annexation of the territory in 1824. However, as Patrick has quite rightly pointed out, the paucity of written records and the absence of a clear and consistent oral history made this pretty much impossible for many minorities, including those so-called small unimportant tribes 
whom Lewis had been keen to record their languages. And there were one group in 1963, the Rohingya, whom Lewis, they from Arakan district, or Hakain, mm. Lewis encountered these people on his tours in Arakan. I don't know one particular, and what particular occasion, but they must have, he must have been well known enough to have drawn their attention to him. And he understood, they understood the need for written evidence and they wanted the, so they could say that they could attest to their long-term presence in the country. Therefore, they, they viewed Luce's visit to Mont d'Or. He went up to Mont d'Or in 1963 as a golden opportunity. They actually write that in the text there. Um, that would help them improve their life and provide them with the means of legitimising their status as Tainimsa. So in the, in the 63, the elders of the United Rohingya Organisation of the Mayo District presented Luce with this formal address. And they requested him to record their history, embodying it in the history of Burma. As since 1960, their homeland had actually been placed under the Frontier District Administration by Nay Win, and their racial status had been recognised by the government. So they wanted it formalised to have their history. So in the address, they asked Luce to help them record that, as they say, Rohingyas had existed and inhabited the Union of Burma, interesting that they used the phrase Union of Burma, which it was at that time, more than 1,200 years. And they believed that this act, if, if Luce could help them, it would legitimate their right to self-represent their own identity in relation to their past and present historical practice and reinforce their claims to ingenuity. So they hailed Luce, a distinguished scholar, a genuine philanthropist, a father of Burmese nationalists and all things. And they expressed the hope that their recent recognition as part of the Frontier Administration would inaugurate a new era for them and alleviate their many sufferings, eradicate insurgency and suppress smuggling, all of which were very noble aims, but rather damned by future uh, events. The Rohingya hoped that Luce would act as their interlocutor by integrating their autonomous history within his generic history, which they believed he was writing, um, of Burma, in order to authorise their status as part of the Union. Now, there's no evidence that I have found that Luce ever actually did at anything, but I think it's still quite telling or interesting that Luce was approached and that he was seen in that capacity. So I think we can see that Luce the man has a lot, if I could say, I don't mean to answer for, but a lot perhaps to put upon more than perhaps Luce the historian, because he was seen by these people as a man of great sympathy and love for the people, and they therefore approached him. So just to conclude with a few remarks, I say that Luce's the Rohingya's approach to Gordon Luce confirms his involvement, his ongoing involvement with existing indigenous research networks, as well as with sources beyond the Burmese borders. Although how reliable you want to estimate his, these sources or his reliance on them himself may be a matter for your conjecture. His concern to trace the origins of the Burmans strongly su suggests the existence of a basic continuity between the pre-colonial and colonial patterns of political dominance. His lifelong study of Burma's old languages and epigraphy demonstrates, I believe, his willingness to engage with the technical problems of using indigenous sources. And although he dismissed the chronicles, which perhaps you, that's again a contentious thing, he was still very interested in the work that he did with lithic inscriptions shows a leading edge in engaging, and his peregrinations around Burma shows his use, his reliance, or his engaging with the indigenous sources, which I think is absolutely the only vital way for people to move Burma's history forward today. And rather than retreating for their complexity and relying on surrogates, although I have to say, I think in the matter of Fang Chu and things like that and Paul Pellio, I think Luce did have some tendency towards that. But he certainly wasn't in the, in the same league as Arthur Fair, the Victorian uh, 
who, did, who relied completely um, on surrogates. And so by dis he did distance himself from the chauvinistic perspective of historiographies that viewed Britain's conquest of Burma simply in light of three wars throughout the 19th century. And he demonstrated that colonialism was created as much by events and interest in the non-European world as by the driving force of industrialisation and the national conflict in Europe itself. Now, as I said, Luce by Tan Tun and others, uh, I think it was Maitri or one of the Aung Suans who accused him of making too ready to make assumptions, even changing the fact to suit his story. However, this is no more really than any writers of history such as the chroniclers have done, and perhaps we all do, although we try not to. We are influenced by our background and where we come from. And he embellished as well. And Luce was a modest man. John O'Callaghan's left had told me some time ago in an email that he had met Luce and found him to be a man of unassuming modesty. And that was John as a young student's impression. Um, can I just finish and then you can ask a question? And he readily acknowledged that it, history writing involved taking risks and on occasion sticking one's neck out because it said, rather modestly, someone has to do it. So as long as hist uh, historians are able to emulate Lucy's modesty in accepting that assumptions can be misplaced or just simply plain wrong, then the whole process, I think, of writing history assumes the excitement of discovery, which is Lucy's, in my view, and I'm perhaps sure maybe yours, true gift to Burma's history. So, finally, how might we reconcile Luce the man and Luce the scholar? As his very pro-Burman views of history in the 30s developed a much more ecumenical approach after 1948. The ensuing civil war and his own exile from the country, where he spent most of his adult life, and, and that's, those things were influential factors in his life. And I think that perhaps when we're talking of migrants, we must remember that Luce himself was a migrant and subject always, he was a migrant, to Burma, if you wish, you know, if you stretch it, and subject to the uncertainties inherent in this status, and also the associated anxieties of belonging. He too had to integrate and belong. I know it seems easy, he married into a Burmese family, and his personal life experience influenced and modified his views about his adopted country. But like all migrants, traces of his ancestral genealogical relationships remained in his DNA. Because although he had little contact with his family when he went, after he went to Burma, and he returned to Jersey, the island from which his family heritage had um, originated, and because Patrick finished his uh, talk with what does migration mean, does it transcend the physical location, or as he told us, is migration is complicated. And I want to finish on a personal note, if I may, and I don't claim that this anecdote has any historical value. But I believe that, however, that was more his time in Burma is probably more about Luce the Man, or at least equally weighted. Because as far as we might travel physically or migrate, we never stray far from our origins. In January 2016, whilst in Canberra, I was going through Luce's extensive correspondence. There were 1,500 letters. And I found, surprisingly, very little of a personal nature. There were no letters from parents or anybody else, except lots, quite a lot of correspondence with a sister, Ethel, who lived in America. But there was one, one afternoon, a short handwritten note caught my eye. The date was the 14th of December, 1944. And there was a one word address on the top of the letter, Rangway, W-R-A-N-G-W-A-Y. And the, li the writer was an M. Snow. <coughs> and the writer thanked Luce for his sympathy regarding, obviously, somebody close to her, and said how much he, 
whoever the visitor or who he'd visited, had enjoyed the evening with you and your letter gave him real joy at a very bleak time. I presumed that the M. Snow was writing after the individual had died. Now, that seems of nothing. But I would doubt that anybody sitting where I was in the library in Canberra would have known where Rangway was. And I wouldn't argue that there might be other places in the world called Rangway, but evidence I found out later. I spent the early few first years of my childhood in a hamlet called Hat Rangway underneath the Black Baron Hills near Wellington in Somerset. And there was an old lady who lived in a cottage up the hill called a Miss Snow. She was a Sunday school teacher, and a funny old woman. I didn't, have, I didn't know I was only a toddler, but I remember passing a cottage. And I think that was whom Luce visited. And I made some inquiries. And I found out that Miss Snow and her relatives had all come from Jersey. <coughs> and they were a Jersey family. So I thought myself, I discovered that later. So that despite his migration, his estrangement from his family, Luce was a Jersey man. And he never forgot his roots. Thank you.